Hi, folks. All right, we've hit four o'clock. Hi, everybody, and thank you so much for tuning in. Welcome to our first uh, our first virtual webinar for um, for Hyperledger Chicago. We've got a great panel for you today. I wanted to give a big thank you to uh, both the Blockchain Institute and Invisia for helping us put them to get, put this uh, put this event together. Mike, thanks for all your help. And um, I'm Lexi Pedromos. I'm with the Chicago Blockchain Center. And uh, you know, depending on how this goes, we'll see what other kinds of virtual events we might want to do. Um, if you want to reach out and learn more about us, you can go to chicagoblockchain.org. And so without further ado, I'm going to pass it off to Alice Mor Alex Morris from the Blockchain Institute, who's going to be moderating our illustrious panel. Alex, take it away. Thanks, Lexi. I've uh, just got a quick little introduction we're going to do here about blockchain to get everybody up to speed, and then we'll dive right into it. We have a really great panel here today, but we're going to try and keep it casual because webinars are a little strange. We're all in our homes here, so welcome to our living rooms. The Blockchain Institute's a 501c3 nonprofit based in Chicago, so just a quick plug about that. If you're interested in learning more about blockchain, please check out our website. We've got lots of free courses and all kinds of great content like this for you. I'm just going to do a quick overview of Hyperledger, what it is, how blockchain works in the enterprise environment, and then uh, we'll dive into the panel. Uh, a little bit about me. I'm Alex Morris. I've been working in the blockchain space for several years now. Uh, prior to that, I worked in enterprise systems and uh, manufacturing IT specifically. So when I saw that blockchain was now taking hold of the enterprise world, it certainly seemed to make a lot of sense. There's definitely a lot of needs for transparency and verifiability in that space. So. We'll talk about a few of those applications soon. Uh, as Lexi mentioned, this has been put together by Invisia and the Chicago Blockchain Center. Invisia is a technology consultancy based in Chicago that offers a variety of services, including Hyperledger Consulting. So if you need help with anything on that front, please reach out to them. To get started, I'd like to talk a little bit about where blockchain came from and how we got to where we are now. The blockchain is kind of a colloquialism at this point, and it refers to a whole bunch of things, but at the core of everything is is actually data signing. Uh, what that means is that you take a piece of information, a payload, and you sign it with a private key. And that gives you a unique identifier to prove where the information came from and also can capture the state of the information at that time, which can be very useful in a variety of situations, as you can imagine. As most of you are probably aware, in 2008, Bitcoin came onto the scene and created kind of a paradigm shift in how we think about this sort of technology. Uh, Bitcoin was then followed by Ethereum and a whole bunch of other ones and various things like smart contracts came into the fold which allow us to take this concept of signing data and add technology systems software into that same space which has the potential to create all kinds of amazing applications and really clean formats for collaboration and really speed a lot of things up in enterprise systems. So then along comes Hyperledger. Hyperledger is the creation of the Linux Foundation, uh, and it is basically a data ledger system, just like Bitcoin or Ethereum, but it is designed to be held in a permissioned network, which means that there is essentially a password to access the blockchain. And this is very useful in enterprise applications, as you're probably imagining, because it allows you to control who can access the chain, who can publish records, but also keeps everybody playing by the same rules. So as we mentioned, uh, flexible ledger technology, and really the core of it is that it's very open source and open-ended. So it supports a whole bunch of things and just creates kind of a design pattern so that Alice and Bob, instead of just sending money across the internet, can now collaborate on a supply chain or in a variety of other situations that might require them to have common software or a common database. This is kind of an example of what a blockchain supply chain could look like. And as you can see along the way, we're adding records to the chain. Um, everybody's playing by the same rules. They're sharing the information across their databases and it allows them to work within a common standard and use common tools to create um, a common data set that is shared, but also preserves privacy of the individual participants. Within the Hyperledger ecosystem, there's actually a whole bunch of different projects, a variety of libraries and tools, which we won't get into in great detail today. But at the core of this are the two in the middle, which are the Hyperledger Fabric and Hyperledger Indie. 
Hyperledger Fabric is kind of like the Ethereum offering within the Hyperledger environment, and it provides the ability to have smart contracts, nodes that execute code, and a whole bunch of other really neat features, and everything else kind of ties into that. Hyperledger Indy, on the other hand, is our identity network. And identity is very important when you're talking about blockchains because that's actually where your keys are stored. And as we said, in order to sign data, you need a key. So the Hyperledger Indy and Hyperledger Fabric have kind of come together to create a whole bunch of great applications here. The use cases of blockchain at this point are kind of an open-ended thing. We don't really know exactly where this is going to go, but there's a lot of really interesting ideas out there and a lot of people are working on some pretty amazing projects, including some of our speakers today. So we'll get into those quickly. Supply chain, education, accounting, banking, government, even nonprofits, everyone shares data and all the data needs to go through some kind of a flow. Hyperledger allows us to move the information across these systems seamlessly and everybody can play by the same rules. One of the most important applications that everyone's talking about is supply chain. When you have a supply chain, you need to move information, you need to actually share information and it can be very complicated to do this in a way that doesn't compromise any privacy concerns. If your competitors know exactly what you're doing at a particular time because you share the same downstream uh, trucking company, then that would be a major problem. So a lot of people, including uh, Tom Klein on our panel today, are working on some very interesting applications around this. Self-sovereign identity is another fascinating application of the blockchain. This is where we essentially give somebody the ability to control their own information about themselves and to have um, people actually attest to who they are, what they can do. And this is actually probably one of the most fascinating applications about what can be done here. On our panel today, we have the pleasure of having Sean O'Kelly, who used to work with the Department of uh, Professional Licensing in Illinois and is now a Hyperledger contributor. And we also have Dev Burrell, who's working with Global ID to build out a system similar to this. Finally, the last sector that we'll talk about today is insurance and finance. And the reason that we really have a lot of interesting applications about blockchain in this space is because there's a lot of information that moves and changes hands and it, all of it is incredibly privacy oriented. Uh, today we have the pleasure of having Satan on our panel and she's bringing a lot of expertise in this area because she's been involved probably since the beginning of blockchain enterprise systems. So there's a lot more that we'll talk about today, but we'll get into that during the panel. Uh, I'm about to introduce our panel, but before I do, I'd like to give everybody a moment to take a look at this wonderful comic from Dilbert. As usual, there's a Dilbert comic for everything. The point of this one is that blockchain is not always the solution. There are a lot of things out there that might look like things that blockchain can do, but at the end of the day, it comes down to an expert. So if you need help identifying blockchain solutions, please reach out to any of us on the panel today or check out the uh, we teach blockchain.org website for more information about how you can actually uh, start to vet those kinds of concerns. Finally, I'll introduce our panel and then we'll get into the discussion. Today we have four really amazing speakers with us and they all bring a lot to the table from a variety of different standpoints. Sean, as I mentioned, used to work for the financial and professional regulation of the state of Illinois, uh, which governs community banks, financial institutions, real estate, cannabis, professional licensing, and everything in between. The department is one of the largest licensing bodies in Illinois and regulates the largest number of state chartered community banks and credit unions in the country. And prior to this, Sean spent about 20 years in the private sector in a variety of different technology consulting roles and is now looking at how blockchain can enable massive collaboration across many industries. So Tan, as I mentioned, is working for Allstate and leads product development there. She has also been involved with the MadeSafe project and a variety of other systems and brings a lot of very interesting perspectives to the table around blockchain. Tom Klein is a managing director of Business Block, which provides consultancy and implementation services using well-established and emerging technologies to modernize business relationships. Tom has over 30 years of industry experience building teams, developing creative solutions and driving operational excellence. And over his career, he has led the adoption of many technologies in a variety of different spectrums of industries. Tom also at the moment is involved with IBM's Rapid Connect system, which is helping to uh, provide technology solutions for the COVID-19 problems. Finally, and actually most impressively, we have here today, Dev Burrell. I say most impressively, uh, not out of any particular consideration, but because early on in my career as a blockchain 
interested person, I saw a speech by Dev and it actually drove me to be very interested in the identity space myself. Dev is currently working as the SSI architect at Global ID, where he is working to provide privacy, security, and preserve portable identity infrastructure for everyone around the world. With that, we'll turn it over to the panel. I really appreciate all of you taking the time to be here today. To get started, I would like to hand it over to each of you to tell us a little bit about yourselves. I know I've already introduced you, but what interests you about blockchain? Um, Sean, if you could start us off, that would be great. Uh, okay, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I hope, first, thanks for having me. And uh, I hope everyone is enjoying their, uh, I call it happy quarantining. Um, hoping, hopefully we're coming to uh, uh, an, uh, an end of this soon, but uh, hopefully everyone's hanging in there so and, and finding ways to stay happy. Um, my wife and I just bought a, um, a new uh, meat smoker, uh, which we haven't never done before. So we're trying different things to kind of keep ourselves uh, uh, busy. But um, yeah, so as, as Alex mentioned, I'm the current CTO um, of a reg tech company here in Chicago called MEI. Um, I'm fairly new to that role. Uh, just prior to that, my, my last previous role, I was the department CIO of uh, financial and professional regulation at the state of Illinois. And so uh, I really started diving further into blockchain um, uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, what, what, what's interesting, similar to reg tech companies, um, which are really in effect bridges between the, the private sector and the public sector. Um, the block, blockchain technology itself is uh, also gonna play a pretty major role going forward in terms of bridging uh, those, those uh, parts of our society. And, and for that reason, I, I became you know, very excited about it when, when I was in government. So um, I am, uh, I've, as Alex mentioned, I, I've, I, I joined Hyperledger and I've been a contributor to Hyperledger for over two years now. And I, uh, I think the, there's a lot of interesting uh, opportunities here. So thanks for everyone for joining. Uh, we'll pass it over to you now, Satan. Tell us a little okay. bit about yourself and why blockchain fascinates you. All right, awesome. Well, thank you. Um, as I think everyone knows now, uh, name is Sita. Thank you, Alex and Lexi, for having me here today. Um, it's good to see that everyone is successfully minding the virus and staying alive. It's very important. Um, yeah, so a little bit about me. I currently manage product strategy and innovation for Allstate. Uh, my prior experiences are pretty broad. Um, they include management strategy with Bain, uh, brand and marketing strategy with uh, an ad agency draft FCB, general management and operations, as well as organizational design. So I've always kind of preferred to be a jack of all trades, if you will. Um, DLT has been a passion of mine for quite some time now. I tell people I only have one regret in life, and that's that I didn't get some Bitcoin back in 2010 when I read the white paper, but, you know, we live and we learn. Um, so seeing the direct synergy, if you will, between DLT and the PNC insurance um, area is the reason why I ventured back into the insurance space. Um, in my current role at Allstate, um, I've been and continue to endeavor to galvanize activity, leveraging DLT. Um, starting some business working groups, tech information interest groups, and really integrating into the product design work that I'm doing right now. Um, with that in mind, I'm not sure, do we give like a little bit of like uh, thoughts around like enterprise and DLT or just leave it at an introduction? Thoughts are good too. All right, cool. All right, so a couple of quick thoughts. Um, so with that in mind, um, I would say DLT more broadly and then Hyperledger perhaps more specifically um, is really facilitating radical innovation within enterprises and broadly four ways, right? Um, one is operational efficiency. And I think you'll find that especially with Hyperledger, um, it's pretty easy to find examples of this, especially in supply chain and within say PNC insurance. Some examples would be like Trust Your Supplier or Open IDL. Um, three other areas that are also key are enhancing existing products as well as developing new products and facilitating entry, entry into new markets. Um, Alex kind of brought this up already, but I think those last three areas in particular, as a quick example, um, have a lot of really interesting um, activity happening at the vein of self-sovereign identity and digital identity. 
fueled by Sovereign, now known as Hyperledger Indie. So a lot of really interesting ways in which um, I today at Allstate and many other enterprises are beginning to use um, DLT. I think you're on mute. <laughs> I was on mute, yep. Uh, Tom, pass this off to you next. Yeah. I got myself off of mute, but I had your example, thank you. <laughs> so hello everybody, and uh, I realize as we're going through our bios here, many of us need to update our pictures in some way. You know, I got the long hair here, the quarantining hair, you know, Sean's got the beard. So Tom, I don't, I've only seen it a couple times, so I don't know if you look any different, okay. <laughs> I've got the twist. So anyways, so so uh, let's see. So Al gave me a little bit of my background. I spent my entire career before Business Block at IBM. Lots of good times. And I always worked with enterprises. So no surprise when I left focus, when I investigated this space, uh, I saw that there's an applicability for enterprises very clearly around efficiencies and almost, even though it's not a transactional system, a way to create a new system of record and the transactions that go along with that. Um, when I got involved back 2017 or so, really diving in, that was the heyday of cryptocurrency. So uh, there weren't too many people who were talking about enterprise blockchain. I mean, there were a few, few people around, but most people were all excited about how can they get involved with Bitcoin, right? And uh, make some money. And, and I must admit that I wanted, I wish I would have also like to use a ton of got involved in that a lot earlier. And uh, I wouldn't have bought the 10,000 Bitcoin pizza <laughs> also. But anyways, so um, what got me first was the idea of self sovereign identity and also creating, I own my data. And if any of you have tried, it's not a Hyperledger project, but if you wanna get a little bit of idea of your data, is owned by you and you can monetize it, uh, you might want to download the Brave browser and just try it out and they'll pay you just a little bit, not a lot, for viewing ads out there. So that's a little bit of a tangent there. So uh, so anyway, so I came back to Hyperledger, or I came to Hyperledger after I left IBM, and said, okay, what's all the blockchains out there? It said, what are the ones that are actually gonna make sense? Because this is all gonna winnow down. and we placed, I placed bets and said Hyperledger is one that's going to succeed here in the marketplace over the long term. Um, and so that's where we're focusing as opposed to Ethereum or some of the other blockchains out there. Still pay attention to them, but I really believe the project, the open source, I've seen this kind of stuff work before. And so it can work together. And uh, Sean and I, and I don't know if any of the other panelists I didn't see out there, um, Sean and I were out at the global forum for Hyperledger right beginning of March. Amazing, Sean, it was three months ago almost. Um, and there were a few, there were probably about, tenants was probably about half to uh, a third of what they thought it was going to be. But it was really good to see the energy even out there at the Hyperledger conference, despite uh, COVID-19 and all the challenges associated with it. So let me stop right there. I, I'll, uh, and one thing I'll say is I'm a use case junkie. So I'll talk when I get a chance here, I'll talk a little bit more about some use cases, including the Rapid Supplier Connect and one of my clients. Fantastic. So Dev, last but not least. Hi, uh, I'm Dev. I've been uh, working with blockchain tech for since 2012 now. Um, I am an identity junkie. So one of the things that I got really drawn into blockchain enough to build two companies and then the second one being absorbed by Global ID where I work now uh, is that almost all of our in online interactions that we do are identity based interactions. The ways we interact with uh, everything digitally foundationally is an identity problem. Um, and the way that identity currently works, it's not privacy preserving. We saw that with 2016 state of leak. Um, and uh, the massive, uh, massive amounts of uh, personal user data being lost. Uh, we saw it, they're not secure. Um, Equifax got hacked and one in three Americans lost their social security numbers. Um, and identities aren't portable. I can't take the fact that I am a member of somewhere and use that to log in somewhere else. Every identity that I uh, interact with is a silo. So we'll explore all of these things a little bit more. But um, one of the things that excites me about distributed ledger based technology is that we can make identity, we can fix identity such that it is privacy preserving, that it is secure. And most importantly for me as a Gen Zer, 
it's portable and more accessible to everybody. Yeah. Thank you all for the heartwarming intros and it's great to have some perspective before we dive into the conversation. Um, one of the main things that comes up in the cryptocurrency space is always the idea of mass adoption and how are we going to get to mass adoption. And I think one of the things that we'd like to highlight first here is that it's really different in the enterprise situation. Um, however, it is still a major challenge. So to get started, I'd like to get a bit of a thought from anybody who wants to elect themselves on what the holdups are, what things are great about it, where are we seeing adoption in the space, anything that comes to mind. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll start. Me and my, uh, I don't think it's a technology problem. I mean, there's really more of an issue of a governance and getting people together and, and working, work, deciding that they want to work together in a different way. I mean, they're all working, organizations, even Allstate, for instance, there's lots of silos within Allstate. There are lots of silos within IBM. There's lots of silos within the state of Illinois. Any, or large, any organization has silos. And then you take that and you work outside of your organization, things usually stop at the four walls at an organization. You got emails and you got phone calls and sometimes still faxes out there. And just bridging that gap is very difficult, especially because, I mean, if you want to use a tech, the semantics, how people actually describe their, the way they're working are different between these two organizations. And a lot of times it's who has a lot of power, who's going to decide how this interaction is going to work. And sometimes there's gives and takes. And so with blockchain, what we see or what I see is that you have the opportunity to now automate a lot of those interactions in a way that everyone can agree upon. I mean, the, the technical term that everyone uses is governance, but you're really automating the way that I'm going to have my interactions between these different organizations. And identity is a key part of it. And actually, one of the interesting things, and I'll stop, is at the, I usually did not talk about identity a lot in terms of blockchain because it was, it was complicated enough to talk about blockchain. Let's not talk about identity and bring that into the mix too. Um, coming away from the global forum, you know, seeing some of the work uh, that's gone on in Hyperledger with uh, Indy and then building upon that with uh, Aries and then or with Ursa and then upon that with Aries. I mean, it feels like there's really solid underpinning now that we can start marrying the two together here. So let me stop there and I'll turn it over to some of my other esteemed panelists. So, so Tom, I think you got called out there. Um, I think that makes <laughs> indeed, sense. indeed. And you know, I called I, out. How, how did I call out? Hey, you, you called out Allstate. Those were the, well, those only were in a good way that you're an example <laughs> of everybody else. <laughs> well, you know, but, but the thing is that you're exactly right. And I always say to people that like, listen, DLT blockchain is no longer really a technology problem. It's a collaboration problem. It's a how do we actually work problem. And I mean, I agree with you. I divide it into three things. One is cooperation, not just within the firm, but also outside of the firm, both of those things together. How do you bring the right stakeholders together to execute on the decision? Um, when you talk about how the blockchain can allow people to agree, um, the thing is that we all have to agree that we want to agree. And right now I feel like we're getting caught up on the stage where we agree that we want to agree, right? Um, and then I think that there are also issues around how do you prove the tangible economic value, the ROI? Um, it makes it very difficult to sell into senior C-suite level um, leadership that they should do this thing because the first thing they're going to say is, well, how much did State Farm, has, is State Farm doing it? Is Progressive doing it? Is Geico doing it? How much money did they save? Or how much money did they make? And because the area is still nascent, it's very difficult to prove out these business cases with real life examples. And then I would say the last thing, as you said, is really around governance and figuring out, you know, this requires a new way of working. Um, there is a very esteemed gentleman, I won't say who it is, within Allstate's organization who had this wonderful idea that Allstate is going to create their own cryptocurrency and then they're gonna make everybody use it. Um, that's just not how it works, right? That's not how it works. Um, and decentralization is going to require people to completely reframe how they think about work and how they think about their relationships with adversarial entities. Um, Alex will probably laugh, but I always like to say, how do we um, practice coopetition, right? Um, and how do you govern or establish a system of governance where everybody wants to be governor? 
um, and not necessarily be equitable. Very well said. Yeah, so I uh, couldn't agree more with what Sotan and, and Tom said. Um, so I'll I'll give a very concrete example. I think of what they're of what they're saying. Um, one of the key value adds of blockchain is this concept of consensus. Um, you know, I, th I think they use the the terms agreement and cooperation. Um, and ultimately, it's about getting uh, if you get people to agree or cooperate. Um, then you, you that's the that's the human process of building trust um and getting enough people to agree and to trust each other is is this concept of consensus so agreeing that that coming to some agreement that that something is true um <clears throat> but the 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 but as they said with regards to enterprise blockchain getting disparate parties to work together where they may not normally work together uh, so uh, in a close way or they are only very loosely working together or maybe not working together at all, that is difficult to do. Um, and that, that is a people problem, as, as they said, not a technology problem. So a very concrete example of this, um, the department I worked for at the state of Illinois, it, it's amazing how much, how much ground was covered in that department. Uh, we, we regulated, part of what was regulated in that department was both all financial institutions in the state and real estate. And so you think about a very tangible example, a real estate transaction. Um, you think about all the parties involved in that transaction. You know, you got the buyer, the seller, the real estate agent on both sides, lawyers on both sides. You got appraisers, home inspectors, uh, the lender, the mortgage loan originator. You've got title insurance. You got the county recorder. You go all the way down the line. And all those parties, of course, have an interest in working together on a, to get a certain transaction done, uh, but they, they, I think everybody's had, or most people have had the experience. I mean, they kind of work on their own timelines. It could take 60 to 90 days for a real estate transaction to go through. Um, and, and the incentive to make that go faster uh, and, and possibly the mechanisms to make that go faster haven't really existed before. But, but blockchain can help enable that. Uh, but getting all of those parties to agree that um, we really need to work, even though we loosely work together today, we need to work together in a, in a more tightly coupled way is, uh, is part of the challenge, I think illustrates part of the challenge of enterprise blockchain. So I wanna propose an alternative viewpoint. Um, I think one of the things that you guys are all bringing up is that what I consider phase one of blockchain, which was um, when blockchain was coming up and it's still coming up, um, the need for collaboration around enterprises came around because we all need to choose a blockchain to build upon or say that we're going to build this application. Maybe all the insurance companies are going to work together. We're going to either stand up all of our own custom hyperledger fabric nodes, or we all have to agree to work on Ethereum or whatever else. And there's a lot of basically startup agreements that needs to happen that I think is, uh, causes friction, um, that, that forces people to have these arguments and so on. One of the things that I was very excited um, to see in the Hyperledger Indian Aries community is that we focus on standards first instead of chain first approach. And what that means is um, we have approached uh, these, these topics by saying, what if we didn't care what chain you worked on? You could use Ethereum, you could stand up your own set of Hyperledger nodes, you can use the public instance, which we call Sovereign. Um, for example, uh, Finland loved the idea of Hyperledger ND, but they didn't want to agree with the business uh, framework that Sovereign set up and so set up their own Finnish ND uh, chain. You could have one in China that is set up specifically to how the Chinese government wants it or a local uh, set of universities wants it. And all of that will work with the tool set that you provide because they, uh, they tie into the same standards across the way. And so you can now have agreement on standards and differentiate across the, uh, the technology foundation wherever you are. And this is actually very similar to how we work on the internet, right? We have a similar standards to HTTP, to the internet, uh, to websites, et cetera. Um, and you can have drastically different um, setups for how you serve that content. And so one of the things that I'm, I'm excited that we're trying to solve this problem is, yes, first of all, we gotta get people to agree with each other. But second, we can reduce that friction by focusing on a standards first approach rather than a chain first approach, um, which I haven't seen happen too much in 
the traditional blockchain world, I have seen happen in the identity world. That's an interesting perspective. It sounds, not to steal your words, Satan, like standards could be the key to competition. I think standards could be the key to competition, but once again, first you've got to like, people have to agree that they want to agree, right? And if I'm the CEO of Allstate and I have this $40 billion company, um, I am not going to want to sit down and discuss standards with you until you can tell me that this is going to either make me money or save me money. And I think that the way most public companies are managed today, which is to maximize shareholder value more so in like the short term to midterm, prevents them from taking this view that is more long term in approach where it's like, yes, let's get our ducks in order. Let's you know think of our standards now today um, so that we can one day do something with it tomorrow. And I'm not saying that this is the right approach. Um, I don't think that it's the right approach, but I think that it'll be, it's a hard sell for me to go to um, C-level executives at Allstate to say, you know, we really need to sit down and establish the standards. I'll use Risk Stream Collaborative. Um, that's, there are two pretty big consortia uh, in the PNC or reinsurance um, areas. In the US, it's Risk Stream, and in Europe, it's B3I. And so I've been trying, you know, and many people have been trying to see what it'll take to get all state to want to join something like this. And one of the biggest barriers to or hurdles to overcome is answering this question, right? Um, of why should I do it? What, what's in it for me? And I think that even RiskStream may be even having difficulty keeping some of the insurers that have joined, right? And the entire point of RiskStream, or one of the main points, is to establish these standards, right? But once again, until we get that paradigm shift in terms of let us agree to want to agree. Um, I don't think we can either implement or even get to the standards. And maybe it even well, goes back. Go ahead, Dev, I'll, I'll let you go. <laughs> my counter argument to that is I don't think big companies have ever really been thought leaders in this space. I think they're followers because they don't want to be, they don't want to take risks. So when we talk about standards, we're talking about a lot of the startups, a lot of the small companies that can build value for users out of the gate. They can bring value to users and then Five years down the line, when the question comes to Allstate, it's not a question of does Allstate want to participate. It's a question of if they don't participate, then they can't interact with their users. And I'll give you a, a direct example. One of the things that we work on in the Aries community is something called DidCom messaging. Um, what that means is right now, uh, as a Gen Zer, I have maybe 20 different chat apps on my phone. And each app, whether it's WhatsApp or Messenger or et cetera, can only communicate with other people that are on that app. And one of the simple pieces that we're working on is a standard called VidCom messaging, such that any Aries agent can communicate with any other, and you could build a variety of different chat apps, and you could build it similar such how email works, where I could have the Global ID messaging app, which Global ID has a messaging groups, all this functionality in it, and someone else could use a completely competitor app, and we don't have to communicate with the, with the competitor at all. We don't have to set up a consortium with the competitor at all. Um, but because we both use the same standards, we can create this br a bridge where those our users can communicate with each other and when you when you have functionality like that and you approach it with those standards uh, based approach it, it's you don't have to worry about making those friction decisions about am i going to have to work with my competitor or not the answer is everybody's using that shared infrastructure it would be cheaper for me to use shared infrastructure than try to build proprietary one because it's faster to do so i have a thought on that but i think tom is going to say something <laughs> Thanks, Sometimes <laughs> um, Going back to what Al said at the beginning here, you know, what's it going to take to get this thing really rocking and rolling? And we probably all have not, as, as a group, right, or as an ecosystem, have not found the a really good catalyst to drive this out. I mean, we all spoke in our introductions about why we believe, and we've seen some snippets, but the catalysts are not there to say people, yeah, I really need to do something about this. Um, at one level, it's you know not getting Amazon. Not that Amazon isn't good. I just ordered a bunch of stuff last night from Amazon. But the integration that they provide in their ecosystem is something that most other ecosystems would die for. But it's still not driving them to create to create the integration that blockchain can enable. Uh, maybe even better than what Amazon is actually doing out there. Um, and I'll give another example. 
that may be something along the lines, maybe not standards necessarily, but a way to think about this. Yesterday, me and a, a few of my colleagues were on the phone with some uh, folks in Iceland, and we were talking about using blockchain in fisheries. So fisheries are really big in Iceland. And their comeback was, well, they, they know how to do track and trace, and they can see what's happening in the, in the supply chain there. And so they don't need blockchain. And track and trace is one of the big things. So, but then we got into the discussion a little bit further in this in this the story was, well, yeah, they have the data, but putting some actionability on it or doing something with it was still involved a lot of people, whether that's on some sort of portal, right, or some sort of report or any of those kind of things. And with some of the, the ideas behind smart contracts and now being able to take that data and have this agreement that we've talked about earlier, all of us, between, I can't remember what the words were, agreement and cooperation and consensus, I think you said, Sean, right? If you can create those, those agreements, uh, cooperation and consensus, and here's what should happen, you can go next level with blockchain. And so it's driving out this, and even your example down there with the, uh, you know, bridging across all these stinking messenger applications out there. I mean, I always saw it in apps that apps were never gonna take off because they're all their own little standalone worlds. And then the way I think it gets integrated is with my head and my eyes. It never felt quite right, but it's worked, right? The world works differently than the way we think. So let me stop there. So, Sean, I want to hand it over to you in a second to talk about the uh, regulation space and what it's going to take to get government to look at this kind of stuff as an opportunity. But before we do that, uh, I did want to mention to the audience that we do have a Q&A that's open. So if you do have any questions that you'd like the panel to answer, you can leave them in the chat or the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen, and we will be happy to answer those as well. Um, Sean, any thoughts on the government side of it? Can we get them to join us, or are they a lost cause? No, of course not. They're not a lost cause. I mean, the, uh, but I mean, go government, uh, unlike other entities, is is not um, is not just isn't isn't going to experiment in the same way that that startups or even other private sector entities could. And and a big reason for that is is of course it's it's public dollars, and nobody wants to to take too many risks risks with public dollars. But nonetheless, you do have pockets out there where where some good stuff is, is happening. Um, and so um, I know up in uh, British Columbia, uh, Canada, there, there's, there's actually quite a, a bit of, of work going on in the blockchain space. They're actually one of the leaders in the world around leveraging blockchain uh, for government. So uh, for anyone that, that's interested, uh, check out uh, what, what British Columbia is doing because they're doing a lot around uh, 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 taxes and, um, and licensing enforcement, uh, so you have those examples out there. But in in general, <clears throat> what um, you know, if you think about the the, the key activities of government, um, well, government's big, so there's a lot of activities that you know government provides. But if you focus on just the licensing piece, um, you know, the some of the key benefits of of blockchain, I, I think of as key benefits are going to be your, you know, your identity and track and trace, which some of the other folks have made reference to. And that's true in government too. Um, and in fact, if you think about identity um, and you think about the different ways that we um, validate someone's identity uh, to ensure that what's represented in the digital world um, matches what, what's represented in the real world. Uh, government plays a role in validating your identity. They don't own your identity, of course, um, you do, but they play a role in validating your identity um, with, with every, every type of government, um, government issuance that, that we all are familiar with, whether it's a passport or uh, state IDs, driver's licenses, um, you know, birth certificates, death certificates, those are all some, rep, those are all examples of, of um, ways that government um, validates who you are. Uh, and so there's, there is a trust aspect there when you do have, have cooperation from government to um, participate in that identity space. So I think uh, as we move forward, bringing government along to, to help to, to 
they don't necessarily have to be the builder and owner of a blockchain, but they certainly could be a participant and a validator of identities. That is a, one of the key areas I think uh, uh, we, we, I think will, will, will be real, it will be very helpful and, and necessary even to have government participate in that world. So I, I, I think there's all kinds of other, other examples I could go into around um, licensing and enforcement and, and, and processes that cross multiple, uh, multiple uh, you know, uh, industries, if you will. I gave the real estate example earlier but there's all kinds of other examples where that that same dynamic plays out. So, but identity having government participate just as a as a way to i to validate an identity is is key. I want to really quickly double tap uh, what you said about the BC Gov people. They are ninjas in the identity space. I cannot talk highly enough about them. Uh, the way they have been able to build that public registry and the Vaughn network. Um, the amount of code they've contributed to the Hyperledger project, they are absolute ninjas with the amount of work that they have done in the space. And they are, they are way more innovative um, and work oriented than a lot of startups in the space. So I just want to do a, a second shout out. As a government entity, they're being one of the most innovative groups that I've seen, BC Gov. Yeah, and certainly uh, uh, my, my hope would be that other, other, other governments you know, follow that example. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, you know, it, it is, it, it can be tough when you're, when you're dealing with public dollars, but I, my, my hope is, is that, that other governments do pick up on that for sure. So on the note of government collaboration and cooperation, I was going to save this one. I'm not entirely sure how it's going to go, but I'm going to throw a wrench into things and see what we come up with. Dev, at the beginning of our conversation here today, you posted an article into the chat about the opportunities or drawbacks associated with potentially having a COVID-19 immunity passport existing on a blockchain. Uh, do you want to tell us a little bit about that and then we can jump right into the argument? Okay, so I'm not going to... Uh, mm, this, this hits home because uh, Global ID, one of the things that we're working on currently is something uh, related to COVID-19. Um, that being said, this article is so well written that I do want to uh, talk about it a little bit. Uh, this is written by Elizabeth. Um, she is uh, a privacy advisor. She was a privacy advisor uh, with ID2020 and the COVID Credentials Initiative. Uh, and she recently quit uh, due to concerns that we were pushing a technology too far, uh, that the science for COVID-19 hadn't caught up to it and all of these things. Um, so I think it's, it's, a very, uh, it's, it's a very good read. Um, I take some issues with it. Uh, primarily, I think, uh, I personally believe that if technology can help solve a problem, that we should pursue it, even if the science behind it isn't ready yet. Science being the fact that COVID uh, test results aren't, uh, aren't fail safe yet, right? So most of the COVID test results that are out right now um, are not 100%. Uh, a lot of them have false positives, things like that. Um, and then there's no legal framework. One of the things that I wanted to bring up with this article was the concept of trust frameworks. And I think so uh, you re referenced these earlier. So trust frameworks are basically that agreement um, between uh, groups that say these are the guidelines under which we operate. Uh, so these trust frameworks don't currently exist for COVID-19. There's a lot of disparate trust frameworks. Whereas if you look at any other disease like uh, yellow fever or whatever else, there's a very solid trust framework where you have um, groups like WHO and whoever else uh, and government organizations all working together to come together and build this trust framework. One of the things that I want to talk, uh, uh, that I want to speak to uh, from what Sean brought up was that I think one of the primary roles of government here is to establish these trust frameworks, these hierarchies where these, uh, uh, these corporate groups can actually come in and have some legal guidance on how to proceed with a lot of the new technology that's coming out. Uh, that doesn't mean they have to touch any of the technology at all. It means that they have to set guidelines and legal framework requirements to what is and what shouldn't be done. Um, and I think that's one of the fundamental roles of government in the EU system. Yeah, you know, I'd agree with that. I mean, some might say consortiums, some might say government, some might say a loose alliance of organizations. But at the end of the day, you know, the point is that we need an organizing framework via which separate entities can join together 
in pursuit of a common purpose, right? Um, I do think that whether we like it or not, government is going to have to play a key role. I always used to joke that, you know, a lot of the people in like the crypto DLT space are crypto techno anarchists um, and libertarians at heart, but, you know, just currently I'm investigating this very notion of self-sovereign identity and in a product context with consumers. And I've been engaged in consumer research, um, in fact, today and yesterday. Um, and what we're seeing is that many consumers are not comfortable even trusting the notion of self-sovereign identity unless it comes with some kind of government backing. Whereas if you have more of like a crypto techno anarchist libertarian type leaning, you're kind of like, but no, but this is my freedom. I don't care. You know, it's the, give me my, give me the freedom, give me the power. But I think for most people, for the average consumer, they're going to want the backing of the government stamp of approval to say that this is um, appropriate and, um, and it can work. Uh, I also think it's interesting that you raise COVID as an example. So last week, actually, I was on a design thinking um, uh, session on how to bring blockchain to bear or design thinking on blockchain to bear in the issue of COVID. Um, and I think one of the things that will help to um, galvanize adoption is circumstance. COVID-19 has led to the creation of all these different systems to try and understand contact and for contact tracing. Um, and I think what people are really struggling with, as you said, Dev, is what is going to be um, that common perspective or framework that we approach to how we handle and manage this disease and how we handle and manage contact tracing. And as we all know, like we can easily see how things could easily spiral out of control where you have these centralized government applications where you're tracing people um, about with regards to their status with this disease and how that can easily dovetail into other things. Have you all seen the movie Gattaca by any chance? It's an old one, but it's one of my favorites. Um, so Gattaca, uh, the, one of the core uh, premises in Gattaca is that DNA sequencing is very easy and you can get it done on the corner in 20 minutes. Um, and the key question that really gets brought up is, if it's easy for someone to ask something about you, then they're going to discriminate uh, based on that information. And so one of the things when we talk about like making things easy, especially when we talk about different parts of your identity, if we make parts of your identity easy to access and easy to ask about, if we make that friction, if we take that friction away, then it also is easy for other people to discriminate based on it, um, which is a giant ethical question that we deal with in the identity space. Yeah. Tom, I think you promised to have a rebuttal to the uh, COVID passport. I promised to have a rebuttal. Wow. <laughs> well, 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 Dev stole the thunder a little bit earlier on where he said, you know, the science isn't ready. Um, and, I, and I do agree. And, and the science is not ready for this. I mean, there's so many things that we don't know about COVID. Every day we're reading, here's what some study has kind of found out with the emphasis on kind of. And we hope that, and we, we all hope we know, we all hope that the answer is going to be the one we want, but it might not. It's kind of like the vaccine that's going to be here by the end of the year or by, you know, 18 to 24 months. We could end up never getting a vaccine. That's certainly a, a possibility out there. So, but we all hope, we all want the happy ending out of it. So it, it's working on the contact tracing is appropriate, but thinking that it's, it's the answer sometime in the near term is not really, it's not an answer in the near term because there's so much we don't know about who's asymptomatic, who's not. Most of us, I don't know if any of us on this call have been tested at all. I don't even know how to get tested. I'm just trying to hunker down and probably like all of you guys are uh, out there. So, so it's probably having this immunity passport or contact tracing and having it having some validity. We're, we're a number of months out at the best of having something. And you know, you, you probably couldn't say I'm going to get into the Bears game here um, this coming fall with an immunity passport without the science being squared away. Which is kind so of there's my rebuttal, Al. How's that work? <laughs> Although I do agree with Dev that really we should be working at it. There's probably things to build up, but it's not anything that's going to do anything immediately. 
Yeah. Don't we kind of find that a little bit frightening though? I mean, there's the one side where it's kind of like, is the science there around like being able to prove whether or not somebody did test positive for COVID-19, whether or not they do have the antibodies and all those things. That's yeah. one track. But the part that I actually find like truly disturbing is imagine a world in which you do have to go to the Bears game and you do have to prove that this application says that you have antibodies to this or that you don't carry this. And just imagine how that could play out in other areas of life, right? And it's one of those things where it's like a liberty seated. Um, once you've given that ground, when you, it's hard to take it back, right? And so in what other things we have to prove that you don't have it before you can participate in public, you know, forums. Uh, and then how, what is the mechanism by which we should even do contact tracing? So should it be as distributed and decentralized as possible, where really only it's an application where um, your records are stored only on your device and your phone, and it runs on Bluetooth, so there's no GPS involved. And so if you come close to somebody who's positive, like maybe something goes off on your phone, but you don't know who it is, but there's, it's basically what I'm saying in a bit of a long-winded fashion here is can we create some systems that can mitigate the possibility that even something seemingly as innocuous as contact tracing can lead to discriminatory practices? Well, and I think so the answer is yes, <laughs> um, but I, I think DLT is the core um, to delivering that. So the guideline there comes from GDPR, which says, um, or, or, or all of these privacy frameworks, which one of the core tenets of these privacy frameworks is limit the amount of uh, private information that you're taking in. So if you don't need it, you shouldn't ask for it. But these are guidelines. What we don't have is an actual government body. We don't have any kind of trust, like we don't have a framework on what does that actually mean? That's a vague guideline. And so one of the things that I would love to see government take more of a role in is going from GDPR and actually describing that um, more in detail about what that means and how that can be impacted. And again, that doesn't have to touch technology at all. Yeah, right? it's, like, yeah. Yeah, like that, that does not mean that they have to be involved in self-sovereign identity technologies, but it does mean that they're taking the steps such that we have the guidance when we're building those technologies uh, that we can build those in such a way uh, that we can pr be privacy preserving. Yeah. Hey, Al, can we, uh, mind if I take it down a little bit different path, a little bit more prosaic here with uh, Rapid Supplier Connect that you mentioned earlier? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Because, you know, the, the cat, there's certainly this catalyst around contact chasing, but even around COVID-19, something that we've been working on um, with one of our clients. So one of our clients is in the MRO space. And one of their, their largest customer happens to be New York Public Schools. And so they needed a bunch of PPE, uh, personal protective equipment. And so they're calling around everywhere trying to find this stuff, just like lots of other people were in different organizations. And what happens in that kind of situation? I mean, here you got a real problem. I need the stuff, but do I believe who is um, telling me they have it, that the quality is any good? And then do I believe that this company is actually going to get it to me in the time that they say they're going to get it? So for instance, you know, I think it was beginning of April, I ordered when now all of a sudden we all need masks. I ordered masks. I couldn't get it off of Amazon. So I ordered off of uh, walmart.com, one of their affiliates. And they said, oh, we're going to have it to you next week. Well, you know what happened. I didn't get it for over a month, these masks type of thing. And, and it's one thing for me who's staying at home with my wife. But if you're having an organization where you need 10,000, 100,000, a million of these things, you got a problem. And so here's an example where blockchain can come into play around addressing the credibility of these suppliers, both in that are they really businesses, as well as um, how are they going to be able to supply this stuff when they when they say they're going to? And then does the inventory that they say they have actually line up with what they what they do have, as opposed to them promising something that they'll go manufacturing a little bit later on? And so um, in this case, IBM took something they already had called trusted supply, trust your supplier, some of the Sterling uh, uh, solutions that they had around inventory management and smashed that stuff together. And we got uh, my client on this so that they could see, for instance, that, hey, there's six and a half million uh, N95 masks available out there. 
from one of these suppliers. And so they were on, so there was an onboarding process both for customers as well as suppliers of these things so that you have a little bit more uh, certainty that who you're dealing with, if you're a buyer, they're actually gonna be able to deliver the stuff. And the way they do that is with this trust your supplier infrastructure based on a blockchain, okay, all the certificates, and I think Dev, you may have made, Dev and Sotan, you were mentioned certificates a little bit. Things like Dunn's number. Okay, does a company does a company have a Dunn's number? If they don't have a Dunn and Bradstreet number, they're probably just a pretty sketchy organization out there. What about their certificate of, of incorporation? Similar to what Sean, you were talking about with the province of BC uh, work that's done out there. What about any FDA certifications or any certifications from the equivalent of the FDA equivalent in China? So bringing those together so that you have, you don't have complete assurance, but you have a, certainly an increased level of insurance from what you had uh, just by calling around and, you know, you're going to have this person told me who was told by this person who was told by this person that these are good people and yeah, you can order from them. So let me stop there and just kind of see if anybody wants to riff off of that. I, I, no, I will say just on the idea of supply chain, I mean, in manufacturing, I mean, the leveraging blockchain, I think is going to, uh, blockchain is going to touch in nearly every industry in one form or another. Uh, but the, the way that it is, that it touches each space is, it will be somewhat different. So, um, you know, I talked about government earlier, but in, in the case of manufacturing and supply chain, you really kind of get this combination of identity and track and trace that really, that really is going to provide a lot of the value. And so part of that is, um, is tightening up inventories and tightening up logistics. Um, and you touched on, on those two things briefly, Tom, on, but on top of that, um, it, it, it will, it will tighten up, uh, the ability for different parties to interact and, and possibly trade with one another. So you, you know, you have scenarios where, um, uh, if if one organization has has a product available and another organization used to have it available but ran out and is now waiting, like in your example with with uh, having to order from Walmart, um, are there alternate scenarios where they could have um, they could even trade and even leverage smart contracts to to uh, uh, you know barter for that information and and be able to provide that product in a in a um, uh, reasonable amount of time to to the end customer. So, it uh, I'm I'm working with um, an organization as well uh, um, uh, called Highview Solutions, and we're we're looking at those scenarios as well uh, on on supply chain and manufacturing. And we're even looking at um, uh, when when organizations want to go back in time and and look at the truth on what what happened. Uh, if something, uh, whether it's, um, you know, whether it's purchase orders and invoices or the product themselves, if you want to go back in time and actually look at what actually went down, because your traditional databases can, can of course change over time, that kind of track and trace, call it history if you want, call it, call it auditability, um, there's value there. There's value in, in providing, being able to provide that um, that information and have it available uh, for an organization uh, in manufacturing and supply chain. So uh, there, there, there's a, um, uh, just piggybacking on what you said, there's just, there's a lot, there's a lot of possibility there for sure. On the regulatory compliance side, if you're doing um, international trade and supply chain, uh, there, there may be any number of checkpoints along the way as you, as you move through a country, as you exit a country, as you enter another country, um, and, and being able to demonstrate that, that the product has uh, followed the rules that need to be followed based on international trade agreements, the, the blockchain can kind of help with that tra track and trace capability as well over time as, it, it's, it's, as it's adopted more. So I'll stop there, but, but just wanted to throw out a couple of piggyback examples on, on what you said around, around uh, supply chain. Excellent. If anyone else wants to jump in, feel free. Uh, if not, we do have a few audience questions that are coming in, so we can switch to those. Um, I suppose I might say it's more of a comment because I feel like it's a 
deep rabbit hole that we could all easily fall down into. But as both you, Tom and Sean were talking, I'm sitting here thinking to myself that in this world of increased oversight, accountability and traceability, um, what does that mean for competition? Um, so if I am mask manufacturer X and it's very easy for any customer to see that um, I said I had a million masks in supply, but I actually only have 5,000. Um, I automatically lose that business. And so it's kind of like going, getting to the heart of like why people may not be completely honest about what their inventory is, right? Um, so on the one hand, you could say that these blockchain enabled systems or decentralized systems that facilitate visibility into the supply chain might have some interesting impacts on competitiveness. I could see it going in either direction. So I'm just throwing out these thoughts for people to consider. And then the other thing that popped into my mind is both you, Tom and Sean were speaking was around what and in what ways could this enable more centralized control over economies? If it's very easy to see where the inputs and the outputs are and the flow of materials across the supply chain. I guess I'm asking more of a question than uh, making a statement. Specifically in this rapid supplier connect, yeah, the the supplier and the buyer have to agree to yeah. connect, so the information isn't just out there in public. Okay. Now, to your point, there's probably multiple levels, you know, in there, like in high frequency trading and pulling, putting trades out and then pulling them back and doing all that kind of front running kind of stuff, yeah. right? <laughs> Um, you could do the same kind of stuff in a physical supply chain out there. So I think there's probably additional layers. But yeah. As they said, they, they MacGyvered this solution um, yeah. here. <laughs> Since there was, a, there, there was a catalyst, right? People need PPE yeah. to draw things and to draw people to do things. And it wasn't perfect in any way, shape, or form. So I, I think you know, this is eventually going to kind of kind of almost the way I think about it. You're talking to the Oracle problem, you know, garbage in, garbage out on any of these chains, how do you keep yeah. on getting more and more specific uh, in that any data that comes on here, I can believe on it, believe in yeah. it as opposed to, and I think it's gonna come along with some of the identity work um, that you believe where this is coming from, right? Whether it's some sort of sensor that's yeah. out there or whether it's some sort of corporate entity that's whether it's yeah. from a, a regulator, a government or some other governing body that says, gives it the good housekeeping seal of approval. Yeah. So we're getting close to the end of our hour window here. I do want to put this audience question up. Um, the question is, has anyone created a customer facing view of a blockchain for a transaction such as transparency within a supply chain? Or are we not there yet? Um, does anybody know of any solutions like that to use with Hyperledger to create better visibility, that sort of thing? I have one if no one else does at this point. Um, so, so the way I heard it, Al, is visibility into a supply chain, right? Specifically with the blockchain added. Specifically with blockchain. Right. I mean, so there's a rapid slider connect example. Another one, um, and following over kind of first came out last fall walmart canada i mean i think this is actually a great story and probably one of the best ones out there um because there's actually some numerics some metrics back to so tanya your point about people want to talk some dollars and cents and uh some numbers that actually mean something um in this case think in walmart canada they have 70 third-party carriers they work with um, they're transmitting 500,000 loads uh, between distribution centers and stores each year. And the number that hit home is 70% of those loads get disputed, either by Walmart or the carrier. Think about that, 500,000 loads, 70% of that. So what's that, 350,000 of them, <laughs> right? They have to go back and reconcile and figure out what happened, that why the truck have to wait, who made them wait, all those kind of things that come along with it. Oh, you didn't give me the order, the full, the full amount. And so um, Walmart Canada, they have business level sponsorship. They built a little portal, actually. They do it via API also, but most of the carriers are just using a little web portal where they can actually see where exactly the trans, 
what, what the data is and the whole transaction status so that they can zero in real fast if there is a dispute. And they are able to take down the 70% disputed down to less than 5%. So there's a, there's a very specific, specific example. And there's actually gonna be a white paper written by the Hyperledger team in Walmart Canada. It's gonna come out sometime in July on this uh, project. Tom, to piggy, piggyback on your example of, of Walmart, because that, that, uh, I had another example I'm, I, I've read about, but I haven't, I haven't personally seen it, but I do know they're live with, uh, again, in the supply chain space, they're live in, uh, in, uh, in tracking and tracing certain um, uh, food products like spinach. And the reason to do that is, of course, so you can, you can more easily trace back uh, if you have a problem with like E. coli or something, you can trace it back to the exact source rather than today um, when, where there's, when there's an issue with E. coli, you just know the general area that it came from and you have to, you know, any, any grocer that, um, that bought spinach from that area uh, has to throw out the spinach and we hear all, all hear about it in the news. Well, blockchain, uh, Leveraging blockchain to to trace that supply chain, so you're going all the way back to the source, can can very much save a lot of dollars um, uh, when when those scenarios do occur. So we're we're only getting rid of the the packages that we think are impacted, rather than um, you know rather than than slashing and burning a whole crop that might have or or a number of crops that might have come from a certain area. So that's another really great example that I'm aware of in in involving supply chain and Walmart for sure. Excellent. Uh, so we are kind of nearing the end of our window here, and I think we've had quite a discussion. So if nobody else has anything else left to add, I think we can probably wrap it up here. Um, to all the audience members that joined us today, we really appreciate you taking the time. It's uh, definitely an evolving space, but there's a lot out there to look into. If you have any questions, please reach out to either me, any of the panelists, uh, the CBC with Lexi, we're all here and everybody's trying to figure out how we're going to build the next generation of tools for enterprise business. So it's definitely a bright future and there's a lot to look forward to. Thank you again to all the panelists as well. This has been a really fun discussion and sorry if I threw a wrench into things a little bit, but it's been great to hear your <laughs> as well. A good wrench. Yep. Thank you. It's been fun. Thank you all. Thank you. Yep. Great evening, everyone. Bye, everybody. Bye.